Hey everyone, this is Kevin from the chesswebsite.com and today we're going to be going over a game between Kasparov and Topolov and many players have said that this is the greatest chess game ever played. Now we'll let y'all debate between, you know, if y'all think this is the greatest game ever played, but it is Kasparov's immortal game and pretty much all the top GMs, famous players, have their own immortal game and it it's just that. It makes them considered immortal in the chess world. So, um, Gary Kasparov many consider the greatest chess player to ever play the game if this is his immortal game then I will have to say this is probably one of the best games ever played so with that said uh, Garry Kasparov playing the white pieces and Topolov playing the black pieces starts out with pawn e4 pawn d6 pawn d4 knight f6 knight c3 pawn to g6 and Topolov really decided that he wanted to play the perk defense and so that's what black is going to be playing here if you haven't watched the video on the perk defense and you want to get a foundation of how the perk defense really plays out and kind of the themes before you watch this video definitely feel free to go watch that but if not we'll go ahead and continue white played bishop to e3 bishop to g7 fianchettoing his bishop queen to d2. Now you can already see from white that he's already developed his knight here to c3 and his bishop here to e3 and once he moved his queen to d2 it was very apparent that he was looking to castle on the queen side. A lot of times if you're white and you develop your light square bishop and your knight here to possibly f3 a lot of times that will signal that you're going to castle on the king side but from here he's already made way to castle on the queen side so that's more than likely what Kasparov had the, had in the back of his mind as far as where he wanted to castle. Black decided to play pawn to c6 and white played pawn to f3. Now this is in a very aggressive line from white here and it's probably one of the newer lines that we've seen at top level play in 1999. Uh, this hasn't been analyzed too much around this time that it was played. Um, so right away we can see that Garry Kasparov had spent a lot of time on this opening and he really knew what he was doing. He was trying to put um, another defender on this pawn here on e4 and at the same time he was really looking to castle on the queen side. Play continued with pawn to b5 and this is very important play right here from black. He does two things with this move. The first thing is he advances a pawn to gain space on the queen side starting to you know push his pawns down the board of the queen side at the same time um, it prevents a very strong move from white. White would really like to bring his bishop to c4. It's a very powerful square. It's a great square for the light square bishop um, and because of this play from black on b5 it really prevents this light square bishop coming to c4 and attacking this square here on f7 so this move does multiple things and you're going to see this a lot in this game there's a lot of fantastic moves that have kind of dual roles and this is one of those dual role moves right here this pawn here on b5 uh, not only advances a pawn to gain space on the queen side but it also keeps this light square bishop and you can see later on in this game this light square bishop's pretty much pinned down to this f1 square and is really going to be the last piece that white develops and it's mainly due to this pawn here on d5. Play continues from here with white bringing his knight to e2. He realizes that he's not going to be able to bring his light square bishop right away. So instead he decides that it's okay to block off the light square bishop with his knight here on e2. Since it's really not a good square that he wants to bring his light square bishop to. From here black's going to bring his knight to d7. And white's going to play bishop to h6. And why does he do this? Well, anytime you fianchetto your bishop to the king side, as black did with his bishop on g7, this dark square bishop here is a very important piece, um, not only for this long dark diagonal, but at the same time defending this king here if the king decides to castle on the king side. Um, now, once white plays this, black pretty much knows that he's not going to be castling on the king side and so instead of that he decides to go ahead and trade off bishops and instead try to get a little center 
dark square play in the center. So right away he knows with this queen here on h6, he's not going to be castled on the queen side. So he decides to really focus on the dark squares in the center, knowing that he's probably going to be ca castling on the queen side. Play continues with black bringing his bishop to b7, continuing his development of his minor pieces. And white's going to play pawn to a3. And this is a very important move because it's a prophylactic move, kind of waiting to see what black does. White eventually wants to castle on the queen side, but this is a very important move. If white were to first castle on the queen side, black could come in with his pawn to b4 and disrupt really what white's plans are. White would be forced to move this knight before he castles, and that's not really what he wants to do. So instead, um, as most top-level GMs do, they always find the right times to play a prophylactic move, and this is exactly that time where he plays a3, kind of a waiting move to see what black does, and at the same time preventing black from coming in and playing b4 right after this castling on the queen side. So from here, black plays pawn to e5, again in the perk defense or any hypermodern defense, once you really develop your minor pieces, you're really trying to attack the center, con the center with your minor pieces, and then later on you want to counterattack or attack and gain center control with your pawn. So that's exactly what Topolov is doing here. He has all his minor pieces developed, and now he's starting to attack and try to stake claim to the center. As we talked about from here, white's going to castle on the queen side. That's what he wanted to do in the first place, but again, he wanted to play his a3 first. And black's going to from now play queen to e7. Now, after you develop your minor pieces, you do want to get your queen involved. If you don't have a specific place to get your queen involved, you always want to develop it to the middle of the board so that wherever you may need your queen, she can hop over, you know, very quickly. If you you know, put your queen to one side of the board and she's needed on the other side of the board, a lot of times a very good player will block off the queen and you're pretty much left playing on one side of the board without your most powerful piece. So Topolov knows this and he brings his queen to e7, can hop over the board wherever the queen needs to, and at the same time getting ready if Topolov wants to, to castle on the queen side, connect his rooks and his development will be complete. Now from here, white's going to play king to b1. Again, another prophylactic move. White doesn't want to start to attack on one side and then just have black, you know, castle to the other side or start to move to the other side. So it's kind of a waiting move, playing king to b1. One, it's allowing him to get a little bit more safety for his king, but at the same time, kind of waiting to see what black's going to do. And black decided to bring his pawn to a6, and this is done for a few reasons. And one of the reasons, eventually, black would like to push his pawn from c6 to c5. Right now, his light square bishop is not in the game. He eventually would like to get into the game. He doesn't need to right now. But later on, it is on this long diagonal, and he would like to use it since it is a powerful piece. But as soon as he moves pawn to c5, then his b5 pawn will be hanging. So this a6 move is kind of a you know, move getting ready for the future down the road, not immediately, but again, you always want to be thinking down the road. So Topolov knows this, and he knows eventually he wants to play c5, and so because of this, he needs to play a6 to support this pawn here on b5. Play continues, and white now brings his knight to c1, and if you analyze it back from this position, this is a very strong move. If white really looks at this and sees what he wants to do, he really wants to get his knights involved. His knight here on c3 is well placed, but he'd really like to get his knight here on e2 to the best square on the board. Now, if you look at it, where's the best square on the board? We can already tell that black's probably not going to castle on the king side. We have our queen. Excuse me, white has the queen here on h6, really keeping black from castling on the king side. And so white knows this, and since black's going to be castling on the queen side more than likely, then white knows he wants to start moving his minor pieces and his major pieces towards the queen side. With that said, the best place, the best square for this knight here on e2, is actually going to be a5. So what's the easiest and the best way to get this knight to a5? first to c1, and then here to b3, and then to a5. So that's kind of what Kasparov was thinking in the back of his head. So again, 
If you have a plan, go ahead and start to move towards that. So his first play is knight to c1. Now from here, black's going to continue with his development, and he castles on the queen side, so he now has both of his rooks connected, and he has the rest of his pieces developed. So black, in this case, is finished in development, and now it is white's turn. And white now brings his knight to b3. Again, he really wants to eye this square here on a5, as we talked about. It's a fantastic square for his knight to be, attacking the entire queen side of black. Now black here decided to capture on d4. For y'all who don't know, Topolov is a very aggressive player. Um, I've studied quite a lot of his games because I have a very aggressive style like him. And so Topolov, now that he has developed all his pieces exactly how he wants them, he's going to start to counterattack. He knows that um, you know, instinctively white has the advantage just because they have that extra tempo in the game. Um, and so he wants to start to try to attack and try to play for the win as he always does. Now from here white took with d4. Now a lot of players would say why not take with his knight on d4, um, especially since after you know we take with this rook, black decided to bring his pawn to c5. Again what we talked about before, playing his pawn to c5, opening up this long diagonal for this bishop here on d7. But if we take with our knight, or if white takes with his knight on d4, Black does not have to right away play his pawn to c5. He can kind of wait. And again, white really wants to bring his knight to a5. So if he wants to bring his knight to a5, then capturing with his, his knight here on d4 is probably not the best strategy. Instead, Kasparov opts for his rook takes on d4. And after the pawn attacks here on d4, he brings his rook back to d1. So that's very small as far as why he did that, but I do want to let you know because you may have been looking at it and thought, man, why did Kasparov not take with his knight on b3? He really wants to bring his knight to a5, um, and if Topolov did not play this pawn 2 on c5, he didn't want to lose tempos bringing his knight back to b3 and then to a5. From here, black played knight to b6, getting ready if he ever wanted to, to bring his pawn to d5. His pawn here on d6 isn't doing too much and it's kind of hanging behind. He eventually wants to centralize this pawn here on d6 and bring it to d5. And this knight here on b6 will be a strong defender of this pawn if he ever does bring it to d5. Now from here, white had to make a decision and he decided to bring his pawn to g3. Now a lot of players, including myself, would want to quickly finish development and bring their bishop to e2. And that seems like a logical move, but Kasparov was looking down the road and he said, you know what, let's bring my pawn to g3 because I want to develop my bishop to h3 and really take away this long light square diagonal and put a lot of pressure on this black king. So although it's going to take him two moves to finish his development, his light square bishop is going to be on the exact square that he wants it to, and that's this square here on h3, where it can, you know, take this long diagonal and attack the queen side of black here. So after g3 here, black's going to play king to b8, getting his king out of the way once the bishop comes to h3, and white first is going to bring his knight to a5. Now again, this is the plan that Kasparov wanted the entire game, and so now he brings that plan to fruition. And black is going to bring his bishop back to a8, um, this long diagonal bishop for black. Topolov does not want to get rid of it right away. And white's okay with that. He has a knight here, very nicely placed on e5. It's going to put a lot of pressure on black the rest of the game. It's going to be really hard for black to get rid of that knight anytime soon. So from here, white's going to continue with his development with bishop to h3. And this is the exact square that Kasparov wanted his bishop here on h3, putting a lot of pressure on this long light square, and it, this long light diagonal. And at the same time, he has now finished his development. So it did take him a little longer to finish his development. He's connected his rooks, but at the same time, his game plan is going exactly how he wants it. Black from here played pawn to d5, and instead of taking right away, Kasparov decided to bring his queen to f4. And this is what really separates, you know, normal players from, 
you know, masters to, to GMs. GMs are always looking for the in-between move. So a lot of players would already see this pawn 2d5 and say, you know, how can I recapture and start to calculate? And top players are always looking for what's the in-between move. And the in-between move here was queen to f4. He can take a look at this capturing later on, but right away he wants to bring his queen to the action and check the king. Now the king only has one move. As you can see he can't come to c7, c8 because of the queen and the bishop, and he can't come to b7 because of the knight here. His only move is king to a7. So already you can see white's really starting to put king, the black king, into a tight corner here. Now white chose um, to disregard this pawn here on d5 right away and instead centralize his rooks. As you can see, white's pieces are really in good position. He has two centralized rooks, he has his bishop in his light squared, he has his queen in his light squared bishop bearing down on this queen side, and his knights are very well placed attacking the king side, or the king on the queen side. So from here, black decided to continue to push up his pawn here to d4, starting to put some pressure. And white decided to bring his knight to d5. And this is an amazing move because white eventually is going to be sacrificing a pawn so that he can open up a huge attack against black. Black decided to take with his knight here on d5 and white recaptured with his pawn on d5 at the same time attacking the queen here on e7. Black now brought his queen to d6. Again, it was being attacked, so he did need to move it. And white decided to capture and sacrifice his rook here on d4. And this is probably the move of the game. After Topolov took back, as you can already see, Kasparov really wanted to sacrifice this just so any time he wanted to, his queen could come into d4 and check the king. And again, all the moves that king has, the black king has, are very limited, so he knows that even though he gave up a rook, he really has a lot of strong attacks. But from here, Kasparov found an amazing move, and he found rook to e7. Now this is a fantastic move, because the black queen cannot take here on e7. If he does, then we have a mating opportunity. We can bring our white can bring his queen to d4. After the king goes back to b8, queen can come to b6, and it doesn't matter if the black bishop comes to b7, or the queen comes to b7, it doesn't really matter. The knight here can come to c6. After the king goes back to a8, it's going to be checkmate. If instead, instead of the bishop, the queen comes here, then it's going to be even a checker, a quicker checkmate with knight to c6. So, as you can see right away, our rook here on e7 there's nothing that the king here on a7 can do besides move to b6. Now, if we go back a few moves, after the rook comes here to d4, sacrificing the rook here, Kasparov actually said that the best move for black would have been to bring his king to b6. Kasparov himself said there's no good way for white to continue here, but Topolov in the game took over an hour to find, well, not really find, but to calculate out that taking on d4 would be the best situation. Now, obviously, he saw that white did have a lot of fighting options, but over an hour of thinking, Topolov, one of the best players in the game, decided that, you know what, I'm going to take this sacrifice, and I think I can fight my way back being up so much in material. So, that's exactly what Kasparov wanted to do, and he brought his rook to e7, and then after the king came to b6, like we talked about before, the queen took on d4, and that's exactly why this rook sacrifice on d4 was important, because it got the pawn from c5 out of the way, so that we can check. And from here, black decided to take the knight here on a5. It was kind of forced. There's no real other square for black to go to. And white decided to continue to push with this pawn to b4. Now again, there's not many other moves that white black can do here, so he brings his king to a4. Now luckily Kasparov thought this game out, because if you just look at this board right away, yes, the king is in a lot of trouble for black, but as you can see, black is up quite a bit of material in this game, but Kasparov being the great player that he is, 
he saw all the lines in the game and he realized that he had a lot of not only mating chances but at the same time he had a, a lot of attacking lines where he could make up that material later on in the game because of the vulnerability of the black king so from here white decided to bring his queen to c3 and she can see Kasparov is threatening mate here. He can bring his queen to b3, so black has to do something. Easiest thing for black to do here is take on d5. It's kind of forced. There's no other way for black really to get out of this. And from here, white decided to bring his, his rook to a7. At the same time, rook here on a7 is threatening mate here after he takes on a6. That would be checkmate. So black is forced to bring his bishop to b7 to attack and defend this pawn here on a6 and from here white can take with his rook here on b7 now again white is still threatening the square here on c on b3 with checkmate so black decides to bring his queen to c4 and from here white takes on f6 so right away we can already see that white's taken off this knight and this bishop off the board so although just a few moves ago it looked like black was up a ton of material now we see that black's only up just a a few points of material. From here black decided to take this pawn here on e3 and now the queen's going to come into the action with queen takes on a6. Now after the king takes on b4 white has a brilliant move here and he plays pawn to c3 sacrificing this pawn at the same time basically saying you know what I'm going to leave my king vulnerable because I'm going to make your king come to c3 and then I'm just going to attack and attack and attack. And I'm sure he thought about this move for a long time and thought about all the variations of what he could come up with. As you'll see, it came to fruition. He, keep in mind that the black queen cannot take on c3 because from here, Kasparov could just take with his queen and then when the king came to the a-file, the rook could swing over and the only move to stop it would be to bring his queen over and it's checkmate from there. So Kasparov knew this and he knew that um, you know, bringing his pawn to c3 would force the king to come to c3 and take. Now he could obviously come to a different square like c5, but again he would be out in the open and he would lose even quicker than he did. So um, Topolov decided to take on c3 and Kasparov played queen to a1. Now at the same time as you can see he's setting this up so he can take this rook here on h8 if he wants to after this king moves. But the king comes down to d2 and the queen comes to b2 d1 and then the bishop comes to f1. And this is a fantastic move because the queen cannot take this bishop on f1. If it does then the queen comes to c2 and after the king moves then the, the rook here on e7 that's good game queen can obviously check it but it's going to be checkmate. So this is a fantastic move that Kasparov found. His bishop here on h3 that was attacking the king, now the king is down here on d1 and now he's going to get his bishop involved here and attack this queen. So Topolov came down and played rook to d2 and Kasparov played rook to d7, basically saying that you're not going to be taking my queen because I'm pinning your rook down to your king. And so Topolov was forced to take the rook here on d7, and that leaves the queen here on c4 for the taking. And after that's taken, then Kasparov takes the rook on h8, as we talked about before. And from here, Topolov can pretty much resign the game. Um, he's down quite a bit in material and white has a queen he can pretty much just run over the board the game did go a few moves further on um, but then once Topolov realized that he's playing Kasparov and Kasparov has a queen he went ahead and resigned in this situation so um, I really enjoyed studying this game reading a lot of different people's commentary on a lot of the different moves and I learned quite a bit so hopefully y'all learn quite a bit as well um, and these are two of the greatest chess minds that have ever played so I do feel like a lot of their moves you can learn from because there's so much meaning in every move that they make so hopefully you guys enjoyed this video hopefully you guys enjoyed my commentary if you haven't already please subscribe and I will see you guys in the next video thanks for watching